What would you do if one day when checking the mail, you found a note from your husband saying he needed to get away for a while? And what would you do if months passed and then years and he never returned? And what would you do if you later found out that your husband wasn't who you thought he was? In fact, law enforcement had no idea who he actually was. And what would you do if 30 years later, neither you or the authorities had any idea of his true identity? I'm not sure how I would feel. Hurt, angry, sad, enraged. But most of all, I'd want answers which is why I became involved in this case and why I'm bringing it to you now. Myself, along with the detective on the case and a group of researchers have invested hundreds, if not thousands of hours trying to find this man and to bring his wife the answers that she deserves. There's one simple way we can do that, by finding someone who knows him, which is where you come in. Take a minute, like this video, Share it here on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the socials. I don't even know all the socials, just share it on all the socials. And help us spread the word about this story so we can find that person that can help identify him. But enough about that. Let me tell you this fascinating story of what some have dubbed the invisible man. In 1991, around Sheridan, Indiana, in the suburbs of Indianapolis, a man claiming to be Paul Raymond Herod was working in what we would now consider an aid position at a children's home, assisting with physical therapy for the kids. A woman who we'll call Mary for the sake of her privacy was also working there. She supervised the kids in the playroom. Mary had been married for over 10 years and had a preschool aged son at the time. Things weren't great at home so when Mary met Paul, they started chatting when they'd pass in the hallway. She was kind of drawn to him. In November of 1991, Paul helped Mary file for divorce from her husband, and he moved her and her son into the home he was renting to own on Worman Street in Sheridan. Within six months, they decided to get married. They filed for a marriage license with the Hamilton County Clerk of Courts. Paul listed his age as 50, although he certainly didn't look it. His place of birth was Illinois, and his parents were Paul L. Herod and Margaret Coletti, both born in Chicago. Paul listed one prior marriage that ended in divorce in November of 1985. Paul told Mary his previous wife's name was Diana Ray, spelled R-A-E. Her maiden name was unknown or Mary couldn't recall. Mary thought that he had said she was living in Topeka, Kansas, or Wichita, or Kansas City, Missouri, somewhere in that area. Paul and Mary's wedding was reportedly a very small affair with only several people attending, all family and friends of Mary's. It was held at Mary's mother's home in Michigan Town, Indiana. Paul's best man was a coworker of Paul's, whom the priest had asked to stand in for him since he had no friends or family in the area. Mary described Paul as always working. While they were together, in addition to working at the children's home, he worked as a janitor at St. Vincent's Hospital in Indianapolis and also delivered newspapers for the Indianapolis Star. Mary described Paul as being very secretive about his past, many other aspects of his life. Things like the large scar on his head went from the crown all the way down to the back to the nape of his neck, went without explanation. When she would ask, he would just shrug it off. Although he did happen to mention to her at one point that he had a hair replacement surgery, but he never said that that was where the scar came from. Paul shared several tidbits about his life with Mary and her family over the time he was there. He mentioned that he had previously worked at a casino in Las Vegas. He said the name of the casino was Harrods, like his last name. Although Harrods is the department store, the casino is actually Harrah's. 
And Harrah's did not have a casino in Las Vegas at that time. It was actually after 1992 before they expanded to Las Vegas. They were previously in Reno. Paul also mentioned that he was in the military. He didn't say which branch, but he specifically mentioned Greenland. Mary was unable to recall exactly what he said, whether he was stationed there or he flew over the base, but she felt confident from the way he talked that he was probably in the Air Force. Paul told Mary that he was born in Illinois, which he also put on his marriage license, but that he grew up in the Bronx. He said that his mother's family was Italian. Mary would later tell the detective that while he said certain words strange, it didn't really sound like a New York accent. He said words like water and order funny. I did a little research on that, and the only accent in the United States that says those words funny is actually a Philadelphia accent. Mary also recalled him being a good cook and preferring to eat at home rather than going out. At some point in 1992, Paul purchased a brand new white Geo Metro. Woo. He was previously driving an old white wagon style car that was on its last leg. Paul, with his secretive nature, wasn't one for pillow talk. But one night while they were laying in bed, he says to Mary, I could just disappear like the wind. Mary recalls being pretty stunned by the comment at the time and said it gave her chills up her spine. Then came Thanksgiving, November 26th, 1992. Paul and Mary attended a Thanksgiving dinner together at Mary's grandparents' house in Frankfurt. This photograph was taken that day and is the last known photograph of Paul. After dinner, Paul left for a while, presumably to go on a walk. Many people go for walks after big large dinners, so it wasn't anything out of the norm. Mary later thought about it and recalled not far down the street, there was an old motel that had a payphone. And she thinks perhaps he went to that payphone to make a phone call during his walk. He came back and the afternoon proceeded as normal. They had driven separately. She can't recall why, but it wasn't anything abnormal. And Paul left early while Mary stayed and visited with her family. There was literally no way for Mary to have foreseen that when Paul drove out of the driveway of her grandparents' house, that was the last time she would ever see him. When Mary got home that evening, Paul wasn't there and he didn't return for several days. She recalls not being concerned about him not being there. She wasn't interviewed until almost 20 years later. So it's understandable that she doesn't recall specific details. She thinks perhaps he was supposed to be at an Amway convention in Atlanta. It wasn't until the following week, Mary went to check the mail and found a handwritten note addressed to her in the mailbox. The mail carrier had scribbled an admonishment on it for improper use of the mailbox. When Mary opened the note, she found something very unexpected. A handwritten note from Paul saying he needed to get away for a while. And there was a hundred dollar bill attached to it. He wasn't at the convention. He had left. Mary waited for him to return. Assuming he needed a few days, maybe a week, two at the most, but time kept passing and there was no sign of him. After a month or so, Mary started receiving phone calls from the finance company regarding the missed payments on the Geo Metro, which was missing along with Paul. Those were actually the only two things missing. He left with the clothes on his back, as far as Mary could tell. When Mary explained the situation to the finance company, GMAC, they assigned the case to an investigator the investigator did some research and informed Mary that Paul had another social security number, but she didn't give her the number or any other name associated with it. This was May of 1993, and Mary finally came to terms with the fact that Paul was not coming back. And she went to the Hamilton County Sheriff's Office to file a missing persons report. 
She called the office frequently to see if any progress had been made on the case, but there wasn't. Because they weren't actively looking for Paul. He was an adult who was voluntarily missing. Believe it or not, as an adult, you're allowed to disappear. Paul's missing person report was eventually listed as a cold case and overlooked for nearly 20 years. When the cold case of missing person Paul Raymond Herod was discovered in 2013, it was assigned to Detective Greg Lockhart, who began working on it immediately and hasn't stopped for the past 10 years. There wasn't much to go on other than the police report Mary had filed with Paul's basic information and that he just left. One of the easiest ways to track a person is with the social security number. It's required for so many things, employment, credit cards, bank accounts, pretty much anything to do with money. Plus, by this point, Paul should be old enough to start collecting social security payments. After all, he would have been 71 by the time Detective Lockhart got the case. So one of his first actions was to try and research Paul using his social security number. He worked with the Social Security Administration and determined that the number Paul was using was fraudulent. So was the date of birth and even the name. Paul had stolen the identity of a young boy that died in 1947 at the age of five. That young boy, the real Paul Raymond Herod, was nicknamed Skippy. He was born in Evanston, Illinois on February 2nd, 1942 to Paul Monroe Herod and Mary Eleanor Condon. On December 27th of 1947, the family finished their holiday celebrations at their home in Bloomington, Indiana, and they traveled to Eleanor's parents' home in Cedarville, Ohio. Skippy was so excited, he jumped out of the car before it even came to a stop. Tragically, a passing car didn't see him and hit him. He was transported to a local hospital, but died shortly after. He was buried in the town of Herod, just outside Lima in Allen County, Ohio. Detective Lockhart reviewed Skippy's information and discovered a discrepancy. Fake Paul had listed his parents as Paul L. Herod and Margaret Coletti on the marriage application. If he was using Skippy's information, it should have been Paul M. Herod and Mary Eleanor Condon. So was this a mistake in remembering the details? Or did fake Paul accidentally put the correct information on the license? Due to his secretive nature and just the few obscure details that he told Mary through the years, there wasn't much information for Detective Lockhart to go on in tracking him down beyond the use of Skippy's social security number. It was determined that fake Paul applied for the number in 1987 using an Eagle Town, Indiana address. Eagle Town is just outside Sheridan. Fake Paul had used Skippy's number for his employment at the Children's Home, St. Vincent Hospital in the Indianapolis Star. There were additional hits on the number, showing he had worked as a delivery driver for Chesty Chips. He's wearing a Chesty Chips jacket in the last known photo of him, and one of only several photos even available. He also worked at a liquor store in Westfield, Indiana. Detective Lockhart obtained a copy of Fake Paul's application for employment at St. Vincent's Hospital. And on the application, he listed his education as Roosevelt High School in Yonkers, New York. Detective Lockhart contacted the school, but of course, they had no record of anyone by that name ever attending, since Skippy never got the chance to attend high school. There was another very interesting hit on Skippy's social security number. It was used to open a bank account in Hoven, South Dakota, not long after Paul disappeared. A small amount of money remained in the account at the end of 1992, according to the year-end statement, but there was no further activity on the account. There have been two legal actions filed against the fake Paul Raymond Herod, a civil judgment in Hamilton County in the amount of $9,087 in 1993, presumably for the Geo Metro, and a second judgment in 1994 by Midwest Credit Services. 
It was dismissed in 97 due to not being able to locate him. Detective Lockhart then turned his search to the Geo Metro, which was still missing. He was able to obtain the VIN number and a search showed it had been sold by a dealership in Inglewood, Colorado in January of 1994. This is a little over a year after Paul went missing. Since almost 20 years had passed, there was no record of the transaction other than the car had been purchased at auction. And at this point, there's no way to know when, where, or by whom the vehicle was recovered prior to being taken to the auction. Although it's safe to assume a vehicle worth less than $5,000 wouldn't have been transported very far at the auction. The highest in Geo Metro brand new was worth $10,000. And by the time it was recovered in Colorado, it had 40,000 miles on it. This is when Detective Lockhart hit the end of the paper trail left by fake Paul Raymond Herod. Detective Lockhart next turned to his valuable law enforcement resources. They used the information provided. At this time, they didn't even have a photograph and they were able to compile a profile that came up with several hits on possibilities for the identity of fake Paul. He ran each one of them down, even traveling to other states, but none of them were him. So he started his interviews. He met with Mary, with her sister, and even with Skippy's sister. Skippy's sister didn't recognize fake Paul and had no idea why he would possibly steal her brother's identity. Mary and her sister were able to finally provide him several photographs and what little information that they had on him. Unfortunately, none of the information provided could actually be corroborated in a way that could lead to figuring out his true identity. The Hamilton County Sheriff's Office was able to obtain a search warrant for several items that Mary still had in her possession. Some of them included cards and envelopes that Paul may have sealed himself. Despite the passage of time, everyone was hopeful that DNA and fingerprints could be lifted from these items. It took months for the reports to come back and there were no results obtained. After quite a few years with no forward movement in the case, Detective Lockhart began to think outside the box. He teamed up with Purdue University's Forensic Science Club to review the case file and help generate possible new leads. He posted the story on the Hamilton County Sheriff's Office Facebook page as a cold case profile. This action in particular led to locating the best man in the wedding photographs. Mary didn't know him, remember him, or have any idea what his name was. But after seeing himself in the photograph, the man contacted Detective Lockhart. Sadly, though, he has no recollection of Paul or the wedding. Since that time, he has been in a car accident and has several health issues that affect his memory. So Detective Lockhart pushed on and he decided to turn to the Web Sleuths community to see what they were able to dig up on the case. This was in 2019. Meanwhile, he continued to run photographs of fake Paul through facial recognition software and regularly received hits. Many of the hits were easy to rule out with the subject either being deceased or incarcerated at the time Paul was in Indiana. One hit several years ago looked very promising. The photographs were super similar. The man had attended Roosevelt High School in Yonkers, which is what Paul put on his application for employment. He had ties to Colorado, Las Vegas, and Kansas, all places that were tied to Paul. And he was currently in Alaska about the furthest off the grid you can get without leaving the country. It took a little over a year for authorities in Alaska to respond. And when they did, it was to inform Detective Lockhart that the man was confirmed to be in the state of Alaska at the time Paul was in Indiana. So another dead end. I personally became involved in this case through web sleuths. They had questions about genealogy and once I answered those questions, I found myself immersed. I spent countless hours scouring the internet for clues, looking up every detail I possibly could. 
It is one of the most intriguing cases I have ever come across, and trust me, I have come across a lot of cases. I have learned so much about different things while looking into this case, but let me tell you about a couple of the rabbit holes I have been down. The first question everyone has in this case is, why did fake Paul show up in Indiana in 1987 and vanish in 1992? And there is no way to know for sure, unless we're able to track him down and he tells us. However, we've developed several theories. One of the first was that he was in witness protection. That is the most common theory. It took a while, but I was actually able to rule this one out based on the fact that he was using Skippy's identity. The Social Security Administration does not ever reuse a number. You can actually change your number, although it is rare and it is a very difficult process. Unless, let's say, you're in the Witness Protection Program, in which case they'll issue you a new number. So there's no way they would have issued him Skippy's number or allowed him to reuse it. Another theory is that Paul was running from something. This is probably the most likely theory, although it brings about many more questions as to what he was running from and how serious it was. If he was running from, say, a child support obligation, I mean, that just makes him a crappy person, but it's a possibility and not very serious, not something he has to run from. He just has to pay for it. But maybe he witnessed a crime or someone was after him. And while he probably should have gone to law enforcement, there's lots of situations where people don't feel comfortable doing that. The True Crime Garage podcast did an episode on this case, and I'll link it down in the description. And they worked with Glace PR, and I'll link that as well. And they developed a theory that fake Paul was actually Joe DeRose Jr., also known as Little Joe, a Youngstown, Ohio mobster who supposedly was killed in 1982 in a car fire, although his body was never found. There is a resemblance in the photographs between Paul and Little Joe. The problem with this theory is that someone confessed to killing Little Joe and is currently serving time for it. Another theory is that he witnessed a crime, and this is a definite possibility. This theory brought me to missing person Stephen Hedgers. Stephen went missing in 1986 from El Dorado, Kansas, not far outside Wichita. This is one of the places Mary mentioned Paul's ex-wife may be. She also mentioned Topeka and Kansas City, all of which are near this area. Stephen supposedly witnessed a drug deal between co-workers at a trucking company he worked at. Paul was actually a truck driver. Stephen's young son had died the year before, and his wife and his daughter were out of town. When they returned, there was no trace of Stephen. There was speculation that he was killed and buried in a gravel pit. That pit was excavated fairly recently, but no evidence was found. While this is a massive reach, you can't rule out the fact that perhaps Stephen was shot in the head, in the same place Paul has a massive scar, and fled and changed his identity. Again, very unlikely. Another factor against this theory is that Stephen wore prescription glasses. Mary said Paul never wore glasses or contacts of any kind. There's some resemblance in the photos, but the photo of Paul is a little grainy, so it's really hard to get a good read on his facial features. Paul didn't leave as much to work with in the way of breadcrumbs, but the fact that he chose Skippy's social security number has always baffled me. Getting a new social security number wasn't that difficult back in 1987 compared to now. I did some digging and I talked to several people who were somewhat familiar with that kind of thing. They didn't want to go on the record, but they told me that you simply picked a deceased person, went to the records office, and got a copy of their birth certificate. Anyone could go do that at that point in time. You then mailed in the social security forms along with the birth certificate you obtained. There were very few checks. One thing they mentioned was that 
Cook County was known as the place to go to do this, as they were notorious for having a poor record system. Evanston and Chicago are both in Cook County, ironically. As for how to pick a person, they said the most common way was to visit a graveyard. This theory doesn't necessarily hold up in Paul's case, since Skippy was buried in Allen County, Ohio, but he was born in Evanston, which is where Paul would have to go to get his birth certificate form. There's quite a dif- bit of difference between these two places, um, when there's probably a dozen graveyards in Evanston alone that could have been used. Also, by looking at the grave marker, he wouldn't necessarily have known that Skippy was born in Evanston. He could have gone to the local library and looked through old newspaper articles until he found a child who had died. Skippy's death was covered in many local newspapers. Interestingly, the details of his death were misreported, according to his sister. The newspaper reported he was out playing in the street with an airplane versus her version of him jumping out of the car. I question this theory because in my mind, surely there were other children he could have chosen that had birth dates closer to his own. This is pure speculation on my part, but Paul definitely does not look 50 years old in his wedding photos. Another theory is that he knew someone in the Herod family, a very large family, and they lived mostly in Allen County, Ohio. There's even the town named after him. Skippy's parents moved to Chicago, and according to his sister, they moved to Bloomington, Indiana before his death then eventually moved back to Ohio. It's possible Paul worked at a hospital or one of the assisted living facilities where Paul or Eleanor spent their last years. If they told him the story of their son, all he would have to do would be to go take a road trip over to Cook County and get a copy of their birth certificate. But then the question arises, how did he end up from Ohio to Sheridan? There are several other breadcrumbs left by Paul, like the name Margaret Coletti on his marriage application, his ex-wife named Diana Ray, Roosevelt High School in Yonkers, New York, the Greenland military base. I have spent so much time looking into each one of these things, hoping to find some kind of trace of him. I still work on it daily. There's many other little hints of things and we have no idea whether they're true or not. We could be wasting our time running down all of these leads, but if we don't, how do we rule them out? Which is why I'm hopeful we can spread the word with this video. Who knows what this man did before he showed up in Indiana or after he left? How many other lives has he impacted? How many women has he done this to? And how long does Mary have to live without knowing who she was married to? So help us solve this crazy mystery by taking a moment, share this video, ask your friends and family to do the same. There is no telling what part of the country or even the world that fake Paul is in by now. So share it everywhere you can. And hopefully someone who knows him or knows something about him or has some little piece of information will see it. And if you are that person, please contact Detective Lockhart at the Hamilton County Sheriff's Office. And I want to thank you very much for taking the time to view this and hopefully share it and spread the word and helping us solve this crazy mystery of the invisible man.